In this section, we are going to look at some computational techniques that work well for small matrices that have simple eigenvalues. The very first concept to really look at is stochastic matrices. Stochastic matrices show up in probability theory, and they have either rows or columns, and maybe even both, that add up to one. In other words, probabilities that add to one. So the definition that goes with that is a, quote, stochastic matrix is a real square matrix with non-negative entries, meaning our probabilities, and each of the rows is summing to one. And similarly for a left stochastic matrix, where it's the columns that do sum to one. Stochastic matrices are actually a special case of a more general class of matrices, where either the rows or the columns sum to some constant value. And the thing to notice here is the following, that first of all, since the determinant of A and the determinant of A transpose are the same, have the same value, what follows is that when you write down the formula for the eigenvalues, the characteristic polynomial, you see that the characteristic polynomial of A and the characteristic polynomial of A transpose are the same. And that says that A and the transpose of A have the same eigenvalues. So to apply that to the stochastic matrices or matrices that have rows or columns that sum to the same value, start with a vector that has all entries equal to one. So that when I compute A times this vector, what that does is it simply sums up the row entries of that matrix. So I'm going to get a vector out of it that has entries that are the sum of the rows. If the rows all sum to the same value, that output is a constant times that vector of all ones. And so that vector of all ones is an eigenvector, and the value that we get out of it is an eigenvalue of that matrix. So conclusion, if all the rows of A sum to the same value lambda, we know an eigenvalue, and we know one eigenvector that goes with that eigenvalue. Similarly, if I look at A transpose and I multiply that by my vector of all ones, that's the same as adding all of the columns of A. And therefore, if all of the columns of A add up to the same value, we know an eigenvalue. That vector of all ones in that case is an eigenvector of A transpose, not of A. So we don't know an eigenvector for A in this case. Let's just look at a simple example. Here I've written out two square matrices, two cases. And so typically when I see a matrix, the very first thing I check is I simply look whether or not the rows might add up to the same value or the columns might add up to the same value. If I look at A, this row adds up to 1 plus 3 plus 1 is 5. 2 plus 4 is 6 minus 1 is also 5. Minus 2 plus 5 plus 2 is also 5. Hey, all of the rows add up to 5. Therefore, 5 is an eigenvalue of this matrix. For the matrix B, it happens that the columns add up to the same value. 3 plus 6 minus 4 is 5. 3 plus 4 minus 2 is 5. And 1 minus 1 plus 5 is 5. And therefore, lambda equals 5 is an eigenvalue of B. In the first case, for matrix A, since it's the rows that sum to 5, the vector of all ones is an eigenvector for that eigenvalue. In the case of B, it's the columns that sum to ones, so we know an eigenvalue, but we don't know an eigenvector. For my next little hint about doing computations fast, is I want to talk about null spaces in a very special case, namely, when I have a matrix A, it's got a single row of non-zero entries, everything else in that matrix is zero. When I have such a matrix, it's actually very easy to write down a basis for the null space. Consider the following. Suppose I look at this row. I'm going to compute the dot product with this the special vector. It's got all zeros, except I'm going to pick two entries in that vector, in the row vector, and interchange them and change one of the signs. So AJ goes to minus AJ, and AI goes to plus AI. 
And when I compute that dot product, it is equal to zero. So what we are going to do, therefore, is we're going to construct that basis out of vectors like that. So let me introduce a little bit of notation to make it easier. V with index i and j is that vector where I've interchanged the entries a i and a j and changed one of the signs. I'm going to want to make sure one of these is not zero so that I don't have the zero vector because the zero vector is not a basis vector. What I'll do, therefore, is I'm going to construct a basis of vectors V such that the Vs in here are Vijs. I'm going to fix an I, namely a non-zero entry AI in my row, and I'm going to go over all of the other Js, the Js different from I. And it's easier if I simply give you an example to see what's happening. So here is a matrix A, it's got a single row of entries here, of non-zero entries, and yes, there are some zeros in there, but every other row in that matrix is zero. I only wrote one row, it could have as many as it wants to. So I'm going to pick a non-zero entry in that first row, let's say three. Then the way to get the null space entries is, let's start over here, zero and three. Well, interchanging 0 and 3 and changing the sign gives me this vector here, minus 3 and everything else 0. Okay, we have treated this entry, j equals 1. Now I go to this entry. So what we are going to do is we are going to interchange 3 and 2 and change a sign. So the second entry minus 2 and the third entry 3, those two entries interchange with a sign change. Next comes this entry, j is equal to 0. Well, this is 0, but then to change with 0 and 3 and change the upper sign, I'll just get the 3 in that location. And finally, for the fifth location, for this entry here, interchanging 3 and 4 and changing the sign gives me minus 4 and 3. And now when you look at that set of vectors, you see that by construction, each one has a pivot. They are linearly independent. And furthermore, how many vectors are there? There are j equals n minus 1 such vectors. And we know that the n minus 1 vectors in it. So I've got the right number of linearly independent vectors that are in the null space of A, and hence they do form a basis. Right? We have constructed the right number of vectors. Now for my next set of useful facts, let's look at a matrix of size two by two. I'll have to give you a little bit of theory, but once you see the theory, the example is very simple. So I'll start with a two by two matrix, A, B, C, D. And the first question is, what's the characteristic polynomial? Can we get it easily, or do we have to actually run our determinant and compute it? Well, if I look at the root expansion of the characteristic polynomial, 1 times lambda minus lambda 2, and if I multiply it out, I see lambda squared minus the sum of the roots times lambda plus the product of the roots. That is to say, lambda squared minus the trace of the matrix A plus the determinant of the matrix A. For the eigenvector basis that goes with that, there's a theorem that I want to use. So I have a two by two matrix, and let's say it's non-zero. So I've got my matrix A, that has eigenvalues lambda one and lambda two, not necessarily distinct. And what I'm going to do is I'll pick one of the eigenvalues. Let's say it's lambda one. Then there's a theorem that we are not going to address in this course called the Cayley-Hamilton theorem that can be used to show that if I have that, if I pick that lambda 1, and I look at a minus lambda 1i, then the non-zero column in here, that non-zero column must be an eigenvector for the other eigenvalue. Caveat, however, that's true only for matrices of size 2 by 2. And to show you how an example would go, here's a matrix. It's 4, 1, 1, 4. And let's see, the eigenvalue. So step number one, I need to trace. The trace is 4 plus 4 is 8. And the determinant, 16 minus 1 is 15. So I know the trace, I know the determinant. 
And therefore, I immediately know the characteristic polynomials, lambda squared minus the trace lambda plus the determinant. When I compute the zeros of that polynomial, I get 3 and 5. Then I'm going to pick one of the eigenvalues. Say I pick lambda equals 3, and I compute a minus 3i. Here is a non-zero column of that matrix. This must be an eigenvector for the other eigenvalue. So 1, 1 must be an eigenvector for eigenvalue 5. So here it is. A non-zero column of the matrix A minus 3i is an eigenvector for lambda equals 5. For the other eigenvector, well, I know that when I do my Gaussian elimination here, I know I have to have a missing pivot, right? So I know I have to end up with this matrix, the first row, and then the second row, I'll get the zero from Gaussian elimination here, and I'll get a zero here because I have chosen my eigenvalue, so I have a missing pivot. So this is a case of a matrix with a single non-zero row, and therefore, looking at it, that row tells me immediately that minus one, one is an eigenvector for our current eigenvalue, for the eigenvalue lambda equals three. So to repeat, all I have to do is look at the trace, look at the determinant that immediately gives me the characteristic polynomial, pick an eigenvalue, and subtract it out. From the first row, I get an eigenvector for that eigenvalue. From a non-zero column, it could be either one of these. From a non-zero column, I get an eigenvector for the other eigenvalue. And that takes care of matrices of size two by two. For matrices of size three by three, there's also something we can exploit as long as we know a non-zero eigenvalue. And from stochastic matrices, from that little example at the very beginning, we know that it might be quite easy to find an eigenvalue. So we'll exploit that. We'll write down the determinant of a minus lambda i, the characteristic polynomial in its root form. When I multiply that out, actually when I multiply out two of these terms and leave the first one alone, I see minus lambda minus eigenvalue lambda 1, and then I see a quadratic made up of the remaining trace of lambda 2 plus lambda 3 and lambda 2 times lambda 3. And again, an example might make it immediately clear. Here's my matrix A, and if I look at the columns, 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 minus 1 plus 2 is 2, 1 plus 3 minus 2 is 2, so 2 is an eigenvalue of that matrix. Since 2 is an eigenvalue, I'm going to exploit it to write down this structure. It goes like this. I know the trace is equal to minus 2, and when I compute the determinant of that matrix, I find 0. From my equation 1 here, from the way I know that that characteristic polynomial has to look, I know lambda 1 is equal to 2, and therefore lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is the trace of A minus lambda 1. And I know the trace, I know lambda 1, so I get lambda 2 plus lambda 3 is equal to minus 4. So I have this term here in my characteristic polynomial. Similarly, lambda 2 times lambda 3. Well, the determinant of A is lambda 1 times lambda 2 times lambda 3. So this is the determinant of A divided by lambda 1. That's why lambda 1 has to be non-zero for this to be useful. And in our case, we get 0. And therefore, writing out the form of my polynomial here, I get P of lambda is equal to minus lambda minus 2 times the quadratic and the quadratic is easy to see the roots of, they are minus 4 and 0. Actually, I could have had it easier, because what happened here is that I know a first eigenvalue lambda equals 2, but I also found that the determinant of A is equal to 0. Well, the determinant of A is equal to 0 says there's a second eigenvalue, call it lambda 2, equal to 0. That means I have two eigenvalues out of three, and so the third one I get from the trace of A minus those two eigenvalues, I get minus four, just as before. For my last useful fact, there are determinants that could be factored easily. So here is how that might look. I'll start with the square matrix A, 
and try and divide it into two blocks, such that that first block in the upper left corner is square, and the second block in the lower right corner is square. And what I want is to put that partition in so that either the matrix B or the matrix C happens to be all zeros. If I can do that, then the determinant of A is going to be equal to the determinant of A1 times the determinant of A2. Let's see this in action. Here is a matrix A. And if you look at that matrix, you see this block of zeros sitting over here. If I put a dividing line horizontally and vertically so as to isolate that block of zeros, I see a two by two matrix in red up above and a two by two matrix in red down below. And therefore this matrix satisfies that theorem that I just mentioned. So the determinant of A minus lambda I that also has this structure since all it does is it subtracts lambda off the diagonal. The determinant of A minus lambda I is the determinant of this matrix minus lambda i times the determinant of that matrix times lambda i. And as a consequence, I can write down my polynomials, characteristic polynomial for A1, characteristic polynomial for A2, do the eigen decomposition for those two polynomials, and I'll leave it as a challenge for you to use what we've just discussed Namely, given that you found A1 and A2, can you construct the eigenvectors of A from the eigenvectors of A1, A2, which we know are easy to write down? And the other question, given what you'll find, is, is this matrix A diagonalizable? Yes or no?